Hi everyone, or welcome back to the channel. This week it's all about journal paper authorship. Hi, if you're new around here, welcome to our little academic space here on YouTube. My name is Caroline, I am a senior lecturer and I specialise in physics. So I research and I teach and I work at physics, I work at physics, I work in physics here in the UK at a university. And today I thought we could talk a little bit about journal papers and conference proceedings and importantly the authorship of those documents. So the reason this is on my mind is it's something I've been discussing with my immediate team and my kind of wider group and colleagues is what re requirements do you have to do in order to justify having your name as an author on a journal paper or on a paper that you're putting into a conference? And it kind of came about because we were talking about our use of AI, so artificial intelligence. And so within my kind of team, I've got researchers who are making AI code, developing AI kind of logic and framework, and then other people in the group are able to draw from that code and use it within their own research. And so the question was, do you, by drawing that AI code from another researcher, automatically mean that you should put them as an author? Or maybe does it mean that you should cite them? Or do you need to do neither of those things and, and not worry about it? And we had quite a lengthy conversation about this, um, you know, because if you compare it to the experimental world, so obviously I'm a physicist, um, I have done plenty of experiments, and sometimes that experimental equipment is borrowed or loaned or set up, and that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to put the person who loaned it or borrowed it or set it up for you as an author. Sometimes you put them as an author, and sometimes you put them in the acknowledgements. And we were trying to kind of translate that across now into this emerging world of AI and machine learning. And where do you draw that line? You know, where is it appropriate to put somebody as an author? And where should you put somebody as an author? And that sparks us into an even broader conversation about journal paper authorship in general. So I'm the principal investigator for the research that goes on in my team. And I've got, you know, multiple PhD students, postdoc researcher, I've got uh, master students, undergraduate students. Uh, so for all of those projects, I am the principal investigator. But in my opinion, that does not mean that I go as the first author on the journal papers. So point in question, I've had uh, eight or nine conference proceedings go out from my, my team across this summer. And actually, I am only on one of them as the first author because it's a piece of work that I've let. On all of the others, I am listed, so I am typically at the end as the principal investigator, but the first author is the person who's undertaken the most significant component of that work. So that would be the student researcher or the postgraduate researcher who has you know, undertaken the actual effort to do that piece of work. And again, that kind of brings with itself challenges. You know, because sometimes I've had cases where students have undertaken the work and then they've had to move on to their job or they you know the next step in their career. And we haven't quite got the journal paper out. And so then I might end up writing chunks of the journal paper, you know, chunks of the journal article because they've moved on into their next job. But if it is still drawing really from their research, their data, their measurements, you know, I typically still put them as the first author and sent the chunks that I've written to them for kind of assessment to make sure they're happy with it. And I've listed myself as the PI at the end of the authorship. And again, that's a fine line. You know, sometimes if you've then written it, but you've done a lot of the, the writing or the analysis, then although maybe you didn't actually collect the experimental data, maybe because you were the one who analysed it and then you wrote it all up, maybe then that moves you up in the pecking order. Um, and again, I've had experience of that, you know, when I was a student, I collected, you know, a decent amount of experimental research, but actually the analysis was then done by somebody else and the writing up of the paper was done by that person. So it made more sense for them to go as the first author and myself to go as the second author. And it becomes you know, this quite an interesting conversation about the etiquette and what is the best practice. 
and then as the principal investigator, I'm also constantly looking across my research team and making sure that everybody's having opportunities to put out first authorship outputs. You know, if you're doing a PhD, it's really important, well, I think it's really important, that you get the chance to first author conference proceedings and the first author of journal papers. And so I need to make sure that the research is, you know, divided and put appropriately onto each researcher in the team that makes it very clear who is actually going to be first author on particular pieces of work. It can get confusing and muddling if you've got researchers who are sharing the same data sets. You know, so again, looking back on my PhD, myself and the PhD student the year above me, we actually used the same material. So we were working with the same particular kind of particles. Um, but I was doing one analysis technique and they were doing another analysis technique. And that was kind of fine in the thesis because I did the one bit and they did the other bit. And it was fine for journal papers because they did one bit and I did the other bit. But then actually, when you were looking at consistency, I had to modify how I was labelling those particles in my thesis so that they were consistent with the PhD students because they were a year above me and their work had already been published. So there wasn't any kind of conflict. It was just making sure that we were consistent between us. And then it doesn't help because different research communities have different logic and principles and best practices with how they decide the authorship order. Now, if you work in something uh, which has got many, many authors on something, you may find that the lead author is the person who did the most work on that particular topic, and then everybody else is listed alphabetically. Uh, I worked in, uh, well, I worked in crystallography for a little bit. You know, I was using samples that had been made by somebody who could grow crystals. And they told me that the etiquette at the time was that if you were the crystal grower, you typically were the last name of the list of authors to kind of signify that you grew the material. So you didn't get involved in the experiments, but you were the crystal grower. I think quite common in the sciences is that we put the principal investigator as the last author. So they're the person who's won the money, who's motivated the research, motivated the project. They, they might have been very, very hands-on with the work, or they may have been less hands-on with the work, but you kind of put them at the end to demark they are the PI, and then you put your first, second, third, and however many authors you have, in, if you like, in an order based on contribution to the journal paper. And I'm also noticing that journal papers more and more are asking what the contribution was from each named author when you submit the paper. So, you know, in some recent journals we submitted, you had to say, OK, author one was involved in the experiment and the writing up analysis. Author two assisted on the experiments. Author three provided computational modelling that was compared to in the analysis section. You, know, you have to list out what people did. And I think in part that's good because it stops people just putting names onto papers. You know, I think sometimes there can be I guess, uh, not, not, a, not a phase, but sometimes people want to list all the researchers in their team for visibility, if you like, on the journal papers. But that might not be appropriate if those researchers haven't actively contributed to the paper. Then you shouldn't really be listing them on that particular piece of work just to get their name out there, if you like. You know, they need to have some connection to the work. So, yeah, it's got me, you know, it got me thinking as we move into this world of using artificial intelligence and machine learning. When people are developing AI code, you know, what is the etiquette for sharing that code? And, you know, if you borrow somebody else's code or use somebody else's code, do you kind of quote them? Do you reference them? Because, of course, we can all use ChatGPT now to write code and we'd never list that as an author. You know, you wouldn't see journal papers with ChatGPT listed as an author. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of got me, got me thinking about the, not the issue, but just got me thinking about it over the summer. And I would love to know your thoughts. You know, have you experienced any kind of difficulties and arguments in getting journal paper authorship and ordering of the journal, you know, the authors on the journal paper? Um, does your group have a particular way of doing it all the time? Let me know in the comments, how do you organise which authors are going on to a journal paper or a conference proceeding? And then importantly, how do you organise the ordering? Let me know in the comments. 
I will see you for our next slide. Keep looking after yourself. I hope you're having a really, really good summer and I will see you soon for the next video. Bye. <laughs>